Hello and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 226. This week, the questions, as per the little consultation I did last time, are taken from two weeks' worth of videos. So guides 266 and 267, that's HMS Bellerophon and USS Ward, and the accompanying Wednesday videos, HMS New Zealand and the loss of the USS Arizona. And hopefully that will allow us to gradually catch up with where the dry docks are until we get to maybe a month or two behind current. And then we'll go back to being uh, one week per video. The Judge YT asks, Is it safe to say that World War I dreadnoughts were more stable than a World War II battleship? Fast battleships like King George V and Iowa have a lot more weight higher up in the ship thanks to things like radar suites, anti-aircraft guns and just more superstructure. How did World War I ships deal with stability once refitted in the interwar period? As with so many things, it depends massively on context, because there was a sweet spot that most battleship designers acknowledged in terms of being a good sea-keeping ship and a good gun platform. And it's possible to design either a World War I ship or a World War II ship to meet that sweet spot. So as an overall rule, as launched... No, World War I dreadnoughts wouldn't have been any more or less stable than World War II battleships unless the designers had taken specific choices in one direction or the other. Now, where it can come about that World War I dreadnoughts might remain more stable during their service lives compared to World War II battleship is to do with additions because well here you can see HMS Canada in 1916 she's already got some fairly heavy fighting tops and spotting tops up there on her main well her main mast and her foremast more particularly on the foremast but when you think about the additions that were made to most World War I battleships some of the older ones would have rangefinders and fire control directors either added or upgraded admittedly that is some amount of weight they'd have a very small number of anti-aircraft guns added and maybe a flying off position for a aircraft on one or more turrets but overall those changes completely added up probably don't amount to more than 50 to 150 tons Maybe slightly more if you were looking at some of the oldest ships that had the full fire control director, upgraded rangefinder, anti-aircraft gun, and uh, turret-mounted aircraft refits. But generally, okay, a couple of hundred tons might, especially up top, might start affecting your stability somewhat. But when you compare that to a World War II battleship, so a King George V uh, or a South Dakota or something like that, which perhaps has been launched with a relatively decent but not particularly large medium to um, light anti-aircraft battery and then during the course of its lifespan is going to have dozens if not possibly even low hundreds of barrels of 20 millimeter and 40 millimeter added to it plus fire control directors for all of them plus about six to eight different radars etc etc by the time you get to 1944-45 i think you could quite easily argue that the amount of stability that was left to you know, the late treaty era battleships was probably less as an overall proportion as compared to most world war one dreadnoughts circa 1918 and this is why you did have things changing on world war ii ships because they realized what the stability implications were so sometimes the relatively heavy masts would go away and relatively lightweight lattice masts would go up because they only had to support radar rather than spotting positions you also had the main range finders for the fire control directors sometimes mounted atop the superstructure rather than right atop the mast you would have some anti-aircraft weapons removed so that they could install other better ones in theory um, aircraft handling facilities were a big one that tended to go by the board because well the aircraft the supplies bear in mind we're talking about recon seaplanes and usually in multiple rather than you know a stop with one and a half strutter or something like that plus the cranes etc etc all of that added up and although you don't see it on the battleships on cruisers and so forth you also sometimes see them even giving up entire main battery turrets in the quest for stability. Uh, 
Now, obviously, when you look at something like a Fuso or a Refit QE or Renown, they have substantially more superstructure plus radar, etc., etc., up top compared to what they had at launch. But for those ships, the sacrifices tended to be in, in the form of sacrificing some or all of their casemate battery to enable the anti-aircraft battery to be installed. And what's often not seen with a lot of those refits is that they would receive extensive bulges installed. Now, obviously, part of the reason for that was to improve their anti-torpedo protection. But by bulging the ship, you restored buoyancy and also widened the underwater beam, which improved stability, which obviously was then eaten away somewhat by the additions up top. But in theory, should give you a return to something like the ideal stability for the ship. Todd Webb asks, if the Royal Navy had made the fusion design and had a 25-knot battle line from before the US had started in on its standard classes, do you think the standards would have still been 21-knot ships? Now, that's quite the intriguing question, because as most people know, in most of the Dreadnought race, with minor aberrations like the Nassau's, which are a little bit slower, or and, well, the South Carolinas as well, and the Queen Elizabeth's, which were a little bit quicker, for the most part, everybody was aiming at 21 knots for their battleship speed. And most of the variation, therefore, came in terms of armour protection and firepower. Now, the 25-knot fusion design had a little less armour protection than Dreadnought did, but carried, in theory, well, in actual fact, an the same number of guns but in theory a slightly heavier broadside of 10 guns rather than eight because of the uh, n echelon wing turrets as you can see here in this mock-up i made so of course here you have the compromise of the ship is larger it has the same number of guns albeit they're more efficiently employed than on dreadnought but its protection is slightly weaker now to help inform what i'm about to say i thought i'd do a couple of graphs so this is from 1906 to 1916, the armour thickness of the latest battleship that was in service in that year, i.e. commissioned that year. And as you can see, Germany, once they actually start building dreadnoughts, there's a little bit of a gap between 1906 and 1908 there where they're just relying on the Deutschland pre-dreadnoughts. But you know, once they get things going, Germany, mostly uh, outside of 1910, consistently stays on top as far as maximum armour thickness on their battleships go. The interesting thing, however, is that between 1909 and 1911, basically, the UK is on the bottom. That's effectively because the Bellerophons, St Vincent's and Colossus drop the armour down quite considerably, as you can see, to 10 inches. But once you get into the latter part of the 12 inch and then into the 13.5 and 15 inch realm for that mo building period it's the usa that actually has the thinnest armor of the big three navies on its battleships it's kind of it's playing catch up but kind of a year behind everybody else until of course you get to the standards with nevada coming into service in 1916 and there you can see it then positions itself nicely in the middle of the pack and now contrast that with broadside weight, which is obviously the weight of an armour-piercing shell multiplied by the number of guns that can be brought to bear, at least in theory, on the broadside. And you can see here is a very different story. So here, apart from 1909, the Germans are very much at the bottom of the league. The US has a temporary point in 1910 where it's top, and in 1911 it's joint, but otherwise stays a little bit below the leaders in terms of broadside firepower weight which are the UK by a considerable margin so we can kind of see to a certain extent where everybody's priorities were lying in terms of firepower versus protection when it comes to ship design in the time period that we're talking about now what's that got to do with a potential 25 knot battle line and fusion battleship designs well as we just mentioned, the fusion battleship design requires a slight sacrifice in protection and gains you something in firepower compared to the contemporary designs that it would have otherwise run up against. 
And when you look at the design trends, the USA is actually considerably closer to UK design philosophy in you know these overarching terms, albeit obviously they have their own very separate ideas about how to build ships, than they are to the Germans. Which means that if the US was facing a situation where the UK has gone, right, actually we're building these effectively World War One era fast battleships and these are the design compromises involved, then going into the design of the standards, I think the US probably would accept that they would have to increase their battleship speeds and make the necessary sacrifices in, ter in other terms to match because they seem to be, broadly speaking, in agreement with how battleship balances of speed protection and firepower should be. Now, granted, when it comes to the standards, the US bucks the trend of having had you know slightly thinner protected ships and goes for the middle of the pack but if they've already developed this trend of well you know we're prepared to sacrifice a little bit on protection in order to get the speed then they might settle for say 12 and a half or 13 inches on the standards now of course the u.s was facing budget restrictions during this period up until sort of 1916, 1917, so they may be somewhat restricted in the overall size, which is going to be a key uh, factor for these kind of fusion battleships in the World War One era, where engine technology isn't quite as power dense as it would be in the 1920s and 1930s. And that might mean they might have to accept a slightly smaller vessel, maybe a 24 knotter, in exchange for being actually able to build a couple of them per year. But I think broadly, yes, the US would roughly speaking match UK out um, design ideas if the UK had gone for the fusion design but as we can see from the design trend the Germans might well not have the Germans might have might have bumped things from 21 to 22 or 23 knots but if there's any nation of the big three navies in the run-up to World War One who are gonna drag a little bit on speed in exchange for more armor it's probably gonna be the Germans. Captain Seafort asks in the previous dry dock, you discussed the somewhat heterogeneous composition of the Grand Fleet's first and fourth battle squadrons at Jutland, and explained it as a desire for each squadron to have a roughly similar weight of fire. As I understand it, later in the war, the squadrons were reorganised to be far more homogeneous, with the 12-inch gun ships in fourth battle squadron and the Revengers and Iron Dukes in first battle squadron. Why was this change made? Was it a lesson taken from Jutland, or something else? It was a mixture of factors. You had the Initially, the fact that you had the Bellerophons and the St. Vincents were built in classes of three, Colossus and Hercules were, and Neptune were kind of, roughly speaking, on their own. And even if you group them loosely together, you only had three ships. And considering that the uh, half, the divisions of the battle squadrons, because those battle squadrons were in theory eight ships and the divisions were four, they didn't fit neatly into any one particular division. Plus, you had Dreadnought floating around, although by, even by Jutland she wasn't part of the Grand Fleet. And then you couple that in with the fact that, of course, Audacious had been lost, so one of the 13.5-inch classes was also down to three ships. You had this weird mix of Erin, Agincourt, Canada, all brought in from uh, overseas purchases or foreign build purchases um, or seizures which obviously had their own performance characteristics again. You had 5th Battle Squadron off being the Queen Elizabeths, and then at the time of Jutland, you had a few of the Revenge class coming into service and in the fleet, but not all of them. And, you know, factor in also a few ships that were in dry dock. So it was very difficult to construct a homogeneous division for the Battle of Jutland, unless you were 5th Battle Squadron. And that meant if you couldn't get a homogeneous squadron, although they did try when you look at some of the divisions, then if you're going to have these random grab bag assortments, then it makes sense, well, if we, we, we've got this one ship with a fair bit of firepower, we might as well stick it with some of the other ships with lesser firepower to even up the firepower of the divisions, as I mentioned earlier, because then it means that if you throw any one division at a German equivalent, overall you're throwing about the same amount of fighting power at them now once Jutland was done once you get to the latter part of the war a few things have changed firstly 
one of the lessons of Jutland is that if everybody just pelt shells at the opponent and the opponent is relatively outnumbered, it can actually make things quite difficult. So the, the you know the famous death ride of the battle cruisers, far, far, far more firepower than was absolutely needed to sink them was thrown at them, even if you take into account these slightly dodgy British shells. But the accuracy for most ships in that engagement on the British side was appalling, not because they weren't particularly good shots. Overall, the British Grand Fleet was actually very good in its shooting, but the sheer number and types of shells splashing down made it almost impossible for people to work out which shells belonged to which ships. So by grouping everybody into you know squadrons and divisions where, okay, everyone here is using roughly the same gun, that made would make things slightly easier and also the fact that by this point more of the revenge class have come online so it's easy to group them up as a whole lot and some of the 12 inch ships were moving out to other areas so by the end of the war uh, as well as dreadnought herself a number of the other dreadnought derivative ships had gone off to other stations and this made it easier because you know odds and ends were gone to start grouping them up into slightly more homogeneous divisions. So if you've got say a Bellerophon and or two and a Saint Vincent or two, well you can put those together and say right, well they're not exactly the same, but they're broadly similar and they form this nice little four ship division. Plus there was also the realization that w between the revenges coming into service. And the arrival of 6th Battle Squadron, a.k.a. 9th Battle Division, a.k.a. the Americans, the Grand Fleet had such a massive numerical advantage over the High Seas Fleet, which, bear in mind, had only added Bayern and Baden to their battle line since Shetland, that it actually wouldn't necessarily matter too much if one or two battle divisions were composed entirely of 8-gun broadside 12-inch ships, because you had so many battle divisions that you could arrange your fleet such that if you expected a fleet encounter, you just, you know, arrange the columns when you did it into a line in such a way that either the 12 inch ships wouldn't initially come into contact with the German fleet. So it would be only a 13.5 and 15 inch ships and with the Americans 14 inch as well that would. And OK, the Americans had some 12 inches, but they had a lot of guns on them. Uh, you could ensure that those ships would be the ones that came into contact with the Germans first and your older, less capable ships would basically come in to either mop up stragglers and survivors or engage ships that were already engaged and damaged, which is the advantage of having so many ships available to you. And as a result, it wasn't quite as necessary to leaven out, if you like, the smaller ship divisions the other factor of course is that even if you didn't want to take a tactic where you just said right we'll stick all the 12 inch ships in the back you could intersperse them with other divisions so that they would at least have supporting fire bearing in mind that the germans obviously still have nassau's and helgelands and such in their fleet so those units would be an equal match but if you ran into a division that was say um, the Königs with a leavening of the bayern and baden against a division that was made up of Bellerophons and St. Vincent's, it wouldn't exactly be a fair fight. Um, it would be very, very much in the Germans' favour. But if there's a division right next to it that's made up of all revenge class, well, suddenly the odds are quite more, more, more considerably in the British' favour. Joshua Dworkin asks, You've already discussed the engagement between Indefatigable, Amazon and Dois de Lomme, remarking on how the weather was a key factor in Pellew deciding to engage a ship of the line with two frigates. Are there other battles you can think of which were primarily fought or whose outcome may have been much different if the weather had been significantly changed on the day of the engagement? Off my head, Samar comes to mind. The weather is actually an integral part of any battle to an extent that if you think about most of the major engagements, let's say for you know, the main period of the channel covers and a little bit further back, it's actually more difficult to think of engagements where the weather wasn't a major factor and therefore, you know, had a significant influence on the battle. You mentioned Samar. Obviously, the weather there favoured the Americans because there were lots of schools and things to hide in. But then if you go to other engagements, let's think of both of Bismarck's engagements, for example. We know 
from reports both from the ships that were involved albeit at, from the sort of the logs and everything of the ships during the combat at Denmark Strait they don't for obvious reasons make huge references to exactly what the sea state and the weather was like but from what they do say and from what we know of the sea state immediately before and after when it was recorded in ships logs there was a fairly heavy swell a fairly heavy chop now that in part could serve to amplify the wave and trough caused by the ships moving through the water the bow wave and the accompanying trough and so it could be argued that potentially the sea state contributed you know via um, positive reinforcement or when speaking of waves more properly positive interference to perhaps increasing the depth of the trough around you know, two-thirds of the way down hood which could have helped the shell get in of course no one was filming it in high resolution from that angle or at all so we'll never know precisely but it's certainly a possibility that could have happened also the state of the sea meant that the destroyers that were accompanying hood and prince of wales couldn't keep up with them so you know what would the battle of denmark Strait have been if there'd been a bunch of destroyers leroy jenkinsing themselves at bismarck and prince eugen in an attempt to torpedo them would bismarck and prince eugen have you know spent time shooting at prince of wales and hood if they had a much more immediate threat to be on hand who knows what their target priorities would have been and then you go the other end of things to the final battle of bismarck and again the sea state was fairly heavy which really wasn't helping bismarck as far as stability went because she was already limited in her ability to steer she was already limited in her speed she was already by all accounts listing somewhat due to water having come in previously and then the fact that she was then turning in heavy seas meant that it's a miracle that gunnery officer schneider got his salvos as close to rodney as he did and it just shows how skilled he actually was and then you step back again jutland for example if the weather hadn't been so utterly foul in terms of haze and low light conditions it's entirely possible that Shear's battle turn away wouldn't have worked because the british would have just gone ah he's going that way let us follow him as opposed to i wonder where he went or you could go as far back as even something like Trafalgar. The sea state was fairly light, and that contributed to the way the battle played out, as we'll hopefully find out in the beginning of next year when I cover the Battle of Trafalgar itself. There was a point where the battle, even despite all of Nelson's tactics and Villeneuve's loss of nerve, it almost hung in the balance. If the wind had been somewhat stronger, that would have made the Franco-Spanish gunners' jobs much, much harder, assuming it was blowing in the same direction uh, as it did historically, and it would have meant the British closed down the distance a lot quicker, which would have actually made the British victory much, much easier. Obviously, in sail-powered uh, battles, then if the wind shifts direction at all, then that's obviously going to have a huge effect on battles as well. And kind of the list goes on, you know, Scharnhorst's fate for example if Scharnhorst had had better visibility at Sheffield Norfolk and Belfast would she have run away from them thinking that Norfolk was a revenge class battleship equally once her radar had been knocked out if it hadn't been for the appalling weather would she have seen Duke of York sooner than the 12,000 yards that she finally noticed Duke of York at when Duke of York opened fire etc etc so yeah they're almost every major battle that you can think of if you change one or two weather conditions it could have a huge huge outcome on the battle there's only a few battles where the weather was actually relatively fine and had a minimal effect on the battlefield in the original battle itself you know things like maybe dogger bank for example and yes that even applies to things like carrier battles because if you think about midway eastern solomon santa cruz etc how many ships were spotted because of a lucky break in the clouds and how many ships were hidden because they happened to be under cloud cover you eliminate cloud cover as a weather condition and you'll find i think all three of those battles would be radically different cell builder 2 asks were the indiana class brew dreadnoughts really as bad as some sources say they were 
Also, years ago, I heard a rumour about a ship with the name Oregon that was supposedly built to the proportions of Noah's Ark, making it one of the most stable ships in the US Navy at the time. Is this rumour true, and if so, which Oregon was it? Well, I have covered the Indiana class in my own video, and to be fair, they did have a reasonable number of issues. Um, their guns weren't properly balanced, they tended to uh, roll around a, quite a bit in the seaway, which didn't help their stability. As far as contemporary pre-dreadnoughts went, they were a little bit undersized, which didn't really help matters uh, either, because they were trying to fit an awful lot into not very much. And, yeah, broadly speaking, they were somewhat overgunned and, and overbuilt for their size. So they're not ideal pre-dreadnoughts by any stretch of the imagination. At the time that they're being built, there are significantly superior pre-dreadnoughts in production. However... Um, as I also said in the five-minute guide I did, they are the USA's first proper pre-dreadnoughts. Um, you know, they've got their first technically pre-dreadnoughtish battleship in USS Texas. The Indianas are their next effort and are derived in part from actually the effort to build more sort of coastal defense vessels than full-on seagoing pre-dreadnoughts. The first full-on, I guess, seagoing pre-dreadnought you could attribute for the US Navy would be USS Iowa BB4. Um, so they're not perfect, um, but at the same time, they're not awful vessels. You know, they, as I said, you can find plenty of better pre dreadnought designs in contemporary nations' uh, fleets, but you can also find one or two that are worse. So combine that with the fact that, as I said, they are kind of a, a first a first attempt at full-scale pre-dreadnoughts by the USA and you can understand and to maybe to a certain extent forgive some of the issues that they have. So whilst they're certainly not breaking into any kind of top 10 or top 5 lists of best battleships or best pre-dreadnoughts in the world ever, if someone put them in a, you know, a bottom 5 battleships or pre-dreadnoughts list i would you know glare at them quite conspicuously because they certainly don't deserve to be in that slot either now as far as whether or not this oregon or any other oregon was built to the proportions of noah's ark well fortunately noah's ark proportions as given in genesis are fairly simple uh, 300 cubits long 50 cubits wide of course it is supposed to be a kind of a box barge type shape um, you know the child's fantasy type one which you, where you see where it has effectively a double-ended bow has no particular basis in anything to do with how it's actually described but nevertheless whatever particular hole form you want to give it 300 divided by 50, fairly simple. It's a 6 to 1 ratio, which is actually a pretty good ratio um, of for shipbuilding for stability. Now, as far as ships named Oregon in the US Navy, there haven't been that many of them, and none of them come close to that particular ratio. So if there was a ship called Oregon that was built to that particular 6 to 1 ratio, it would have, well, either been an, a non-USS auxiliary or perhaps a merchant vessel or something else. The Oregons that were built don't come anywhere close to that. The um, the sail-powered version is considerably short of the mark. The current nuclear-powered submarine version is massively over that mark. Um, USS Oregon, the Indiana-class battleship, comes closest, but she's near enough, actually, a 5 to 1 ratio rather than 6 to 1. Interestingly, though, if you happen to want to start calculating stability and so forth, although obviously it's affected by armament and all sorts of other things as well, because battleships aren't big floating boxes, but there are two classes of US battleship that are just post-date Oregon, the Indiana class, which are pretty much spot-on 6 to 1 ratio ships, and that's the Connecticut class, the last US battle line pre-dreadnoughts, and the Delaware class. Uh, both of those have near enough, as makes no difference, perfect 6 to 1 ratios for length to beam. And the South Dakota class of World War II is only just above it. UNSC Forward on to Dawn asks, Given the insane luck HMS New Zealand had, and given the Navy tradition of naming ships after lucky or successful predecessors, why has there never been another HMS New Zealand? So you basically have to look at the circumstances of how and why you got the name New Zealand in the first place. Essentially, and 
just so before anyone says I didn't know about it, there almost, almost was another HMS New Zealand. If we'd built the Malta class carriers, one of them was planned to be called HMS New Zealand. Now, essentially in the Royal Navy, there are two ways where the name HMS New Zealand, New Zealand would be considered a acceptable one. Um, firstly, the caveat of it would have to be a big ship because it's, you know, it's being named after a country or colony, depending on the time period you're looking at. So it has to be a fairly major vessel. But beyond that, the most common way that that's going to happen is if the ship is being named as part of a run of other ships, which are also being named after various overseas possessions, dominions, colonies, allies, whatever, again, depending on the time period. So there had actually been a previous HMS New Zealand that was in service at the time of the famous battle cruiser, which was one of the King Edward VII class battleships. And when you look at the names of those, oh, King Edward VII, okay, newly crowned monarch, etc., etc. But the others were Commonwealth, Dominion, Hindustan, uh, which was another name for India, uh, or the area that the British occupied, British India, the Raj, whatever you want to call it at the time, uh, Britannia, New Zealand, Africa, and Hibernia. Um, Hibernia possibly being something of an overlap with Britannia, but you know, never mind uh, ancient geography and all that. Then you had the battle cruiser New Zealand, which was named such because New Zealand had paid for it. So, you know, they get they get to have it named after them. Uh, the battleship, the pre battleship New Zealand, incidentally, was renamed Zealandia um, in order to free the name up for the battle cruiser. And then, obviously, I said you had the Malta class that was then cancelled. So you've got either some kind of colony overseas dominion related naming convention going on like you had with the king edward the seventh and of course with the malters or new zealand pays for a capital ship and once you get into world war ii well new zealand while there was the royal new zealand navy uh, wasn't really in a position to pay for a battleship nor were the british really in a position to release a capital ship to their control so you didn't get an HMS New Zealand during World War II. Then, again, the cancelled Malta. Then the New Zealand Navy becomes part of, you know, the country of New Zealand. And at that point, it's no longer suitable for the Royal Navy to make that call on using the name. But the New Zealand Navy could if they wanted to. But of course, it's the name of their country. It's a presti therefore a prestigious name and it would therefore logically be assigned to a very large prestigious vessel and with the best will in the world uh, the royal new zealand navy since it uh, since new zealand itself became independence has not exactly possessed what would today be considered full-size major capital units either a large submarine an aircraft carrier or something like that and so rather understandably they haven't used the name new zealand either Josh Thomas Moore asks, An odd thought came to mind recently. Why was the force at Gibraltar called Force H? I would have thought it would have been called Force G, since G stands for Gibraltar. Um, so how were forces like Force H given their name? Was it random or was it in order of importance? So it's basically just luck of the draw. At the beginning of the war, the Royal Navy obviously had various commitments. You had the Home Fleet, the Mediterranean Fleet, the Eastern Fleet, etc., etc., and a small number of kind of split off forces which were generally given alphabetical designations however about a month into the war it suddenly became apparent that there were raiders like Graf Spee about and so in order to form a bunch of coherent hunting fo forces to track down Graf Spee and other surface raiders suddenly a whole slew of force Force designations were created, including at least forces F through L and Y, um, pretty much all generated on the same day, as you know, this is the name for two, three, four, five, six or so ships, which we are going to use to sanitize this local area of potential German threats. And as time went on, some of these forces would be formed, reformed, disbanded, 
formed again. Well, the, the letter would be reused somewhere else for a completely different formation using completely different ships. And so things would bounce back and forth all the time. So, you, for example, you know, Force B. If you looked at Force B in 1940, Force B was an element of the Mediterranean fleet um, dealing with the Italian navy. But in early 1942, Force B was the four surviving revenge class battleships in the Eastern Fleet. And, you know, back and forth and so on and so forth. Um, you see Force D, for example, referenced in the evacuation of Crete as one of the sort of major forces that was involved there. But prior to that, Force D was a completely separate formation that was based down at Malta. In the case of Force H... Force H was one of the various hunting forces that was put together to try and track down German surface raiders. And like Force G, it was stationed down in the southern Atlantic. But once the Graf Spee had been destroyed, it was reallocated up to Gibraltar and then developed into the Force H that we tend to know of at these days which tends to involve most famously the battle cruiser renown and the carrier arc royal but force h as i said it had at some points multiple capital ships in it and at other points obviously once arc royal was had been sunk um, occasionally had none or only one notionally assigned to it and varied all around but then force h itself would be disbanded in 1943 because you know the by that point, the need for various small independent forces to go hunting and guard every which way was no longer needed, and the Royal Navy could concentrate back into kind of fleet formations again. Steve Valley asks, I was started to look into the Courageous class some days ago. There are two narratives that I see repeated over and over. One, that they were built with shallow draft to operate in the Baltic, and two, that they were converted to carriers because of the Washington Treaty. I can't find any support for either of these narratives that makes any sense. As you pointed out in your five-minute guide to the Courageouses, the Germans could just send capital ships into the Baltic if they wanted to via the Kiel Canal. So if the Courageouses are the only big gun ships in the Baltic, they're kind of dead. And the Washington Naval Treaty does not appear to regard the Courageouses as capital ships. They don't appear on the capital ship disposal list or on the retention list. And there doesn't seem to be any wording in there that compels their conversion. So... Why were they built? One theory I've heard is that they were built as small and cheap cruiser killers. Well, I think you have to divide the Courageous class up into two sections. Courageous and Glorious in the one and Furious in the other. Now, Furious, for her, I am entirely willing to buy the idea that she's designed almost entirely for the Baltic project because, well, with two guns, um, the two big 18-inch guns, she is about as unsuitable for mid-ocean combat as you can possibly make a ship that's so large and so heavily armed. Whereas if you think of it as a fast monitor, well, it, it starts to make a certain degree of sense. With the Courageouses, they do at least have a four-gun broadside so they can get some kind of useful salvo work going. Now, as far as small, relatively speaking, small cheap cruiser killers one has to bear in mind that firstly the courageouses were designed in part to get around the restrictions that had been put on the building of new capital ships by the treasury they weren't what fisher wanted straight up if he'd gotten his way and the treasury hadn't said you can't have new capital ships he probably just would have built modified renown class um, something of halfway house between renown and hood so from the start, the Courageouses are a compromised design. I would reject the idea that they are designed as cruiser killers per se, largely on the grounds that their armor protection is absolutely minimal. Now, you can make arguments back and forth, obviously, as to the armor protection of, say, the Invincibles, where they have armor that renders them pretty much immune to cruiser gunfire, but not to capital ship grade gunfire but considering that the courageous is max out at three inches of armor it would be to my mind incredibly stupid to build a sort of roughly twenty thousand ton high speed cruiser killer which is then vulnerable to pretty much any 
cruiser based gun that's kind of roughly sort of 5.96 inches or greater and at closer ranges even a 4.1 inch would be something of a hazard now okay germany wasn't exactly big on armored cruiser stocks by the time the courageous hit the water but the flip side was everybody knew light armored cruiser um i.e the successor of the protected cruisers their gun armament was increasing the british had had mostly four inch armed with a bit of six inch but with the various derivations of the town class and then the sea class they knew they themselves were equipping their light armored cruisers with more and more six inch weapons and they also knew that the germans were putting more and more 5.9s on so you know even fisher wouldn't make his capital ships completely or near enough completely vulnerable to much smaller much cheaper ships that the ships were intended to kill if you know that's what they were intended to do so whilst they might have been utilized in that role for example the second battle of heligoland bite and there is a limited potential for them to fulfill that role given the considerable range advantage of the 15 inch gun it has over 4.1 or 5.9 inch weapons I don't think that was their primary role. And as you mentioned, you know, sending them in as the major frontline ship for a Baltic attack when the Germans can just sail half the high seas fleet through the Kiel Canal, that doesn't really seem to add up much to me either. Now, granted, some of the draft issues were to do with the design of the ship and the fact, well, it was a very weird design to start with, so maybe Fisher wanted a little less draft, but it, they still don't make too much sense as um, sort of the main vanguard of the Baltic fleet unless again he was aiming for some kind of set of fast monitors but that would entail sending a significant portion of the grand fleet in as well to escort them at which point they would essentially become monitors that can keep up with the rest of the grand fleet now there are two scenarios which i think might come closest to envisaging what fisher had in mind for them the first would be if we were going to go with the Baltic idea, perhaps that Fisher envisaged the Grand Fleet taking a major offensive role in the North Sea at the same time as the Baltic force went in, at which point the Courageouses would only have to deal with pre-dreadnoughts, because presumably the entire German dreadnought fleet would be out fighting the Grand Fleet. Now, against pre-dreadnoughts, the Courageouses have a massive turn of speed, and, you know, modern 15-inch 42 guns versus the older German 11-inch guns, they're going to horrifically outrange them. And given that they're pre-dreadnoughts, four guns versus four guns is maybe not so much of a terrible issue. So perhaps in that scenario, Fisher had the idea of Courageous and Glorious dancing around at long range with, you know, the latest and greatest in fire control, potting German pre-dreadnoughts um, without much they could do in reply at which point the lack of armor makes a certain amount of sense because if you're firing beyond the range of your enemy to reply it doesn't matter what armor you have because no one's going to be able to reach you with shells in the first place a little bit of a dangerous assumption the other possibility that i could envisage is that perhaps well and again given that the fisher was designing them under significant constraints is that while they could be built fairly quickly and maybe Fisher saw, thought that something with heavy guns was better than nothing with heavy guns. And again, there's a potential utility to them as support units for the Grand Fleet. Now, obviously, people talked about armored cruisers and even battle cruisers being used as support for main battle fleets. But for the Germans, that very definitely took the form of the battle cruisers standing in the line of battle. Uh, for the British kind of but not really as much um, although there was the idea of the battle cruisers you know chasing down crippled ships or possibly heading off a formation with a hail of fire or something like that but with the courageous and glorious i can possibly see maybe some idea wherein again you know armed with 15 inch guns they have longer range firepower than most you know given that the bulk of both sides fleets even in the latter part of the war are still armed with 11 and 12 inch guns and obviously the british have a fair number of 13.5s present as well so maybe the idea of them was to provide a little bit of backbone for the light cruiser squ uh, squadrons and then in the in a main firefight 
using their speed, they could perhaps drop behind the battle line and presumably maybe firing through gaps in the battle line or kind of like the Russians in the Black Sea using data transmitted from the battleships on the front line, they could fire over the heads of older ships to sort of leaven up their firepower. So if you've got, you know, say a division of St. Vincent's and maybe they run into uh, the Kaisers, and so they're a little bit hard pressed, well, then they can be saying, OK, well, we are here and we are firing at, let's say, 14,000 yards and... That's where the enemy are. They're 14,000 yards away on, I don't know, bearing 060. And if the Courageouses are sitting five, 6,000 yards further back or so, well, as per, you know, 5th Battle Squadron, they can, 15-inch guns can range out that far. And then maybe they plug that data in and go, OK, well, add four, 5,000 yards to that range and fire away. And now there's a bunch of 15-inch shells dropping in. Um, to support the older ships, which might correlate with Fisher's idea that you know there was this acceleration where ships would become very rapidly obsolete, and you know as a something's better than nothing given the constraints that he's in, it would be a very u- niche and unique use of the vessels. But I think that makes at least a possible sense, and I think maybe we're we're always going to be a little bit up in the air as to what exactly these ships were used for, because it seems once they got into service, even the Royal Navy didn't necessarily know exactly what they were going to be used for. I just look at the attempts to turn the two of them into either, you know, Fisher's own torpedo boat, um, with a dozen plus torpedo tubes on one, and, you know, the world's largest mine layer <laughs> on the other one. Trevor Polasek asks, to the best of your knowledge, would the Anglo-Japanese alliance have survived into the 1940s if it was not broken up by treaties? Would the UK have allowed Japanese imperialism or would it have been able to rein in their ambitions? Now, I think this is an impossible question to answer for certain. And obviously, I'm not an expert in politics generally. I'm trying to say as far away from that as humanly possible and Japanese historical politics in particular. From the looking into Japanese politics that you get from looking into naval history, however, um, I suppose I could make an educated guess with a bunch of caveats. The big caveat, of course, being that, you know, Japanese internal politics may well do its own thing and they may end up in near enough the same situation they end up in World War II anyway. Who knows? But... I do get the impression that the sort of external looking Japanese political alignment did take something of a big hit with the Washington Naval Treaty, partly because they were kind of cast out on their own. The alliance with the British was arbitrarily ended and that obviously left them in a perceived slightly weaker position because if they looked at their balance of forces in, say, 1920, with a potential conflict with America on the horizon, they obviously would prefer to be able to take on the US Navy straight up in a 1v1, um, even if they had to use you know various tactics to diminish the American Navy's strength. But there was this kind of, well, if absolute worst comes to worst, we could theoretically call on the British. I mean, the British had called on us in World War I, um, so you know, turnabout is fair play. That certainty was knocked out from beneath them, and between that and the fact that obviously the British kind of coordinated with the Americans at the Washington Naval Treaty to negotiate the Japanese down from what they now wanted as a standalone power, it kind of soured them to the idea of the West as a whole, and Britain in particular, as allies. Now, it didn't wasn't an immediate turnaround overnight. There were still fairly cordial Anglo-Japanese relations through the 20s, even if they did start to degrade as Japan went more and more imperialistic. But, you know, which was the precipitator of the other? Who knows? If, on the other hand, the Anglo-Japanese alliance had been allowed to continue, then the Japanese might have been considerably happier with the idea of the 553 alignment that they got with Washington. They wouldn't have been too thrilled, but they could mentally, you know, tot up in their heads, well, we are allies of the British, which would give us an 8-5 to advantage in the event of a full-out war. 
which was exactly why the Americans were going to insist that that alliance get broken. Um, and as a result, if the Anglo-Japanese alliance continues and they are less set against Britain in particular, uh, the West as a, a whole, then that in turn may have hobbled the ability of the military to get not necessarily get as involved in politics as it did, but to be quite as radical as it was. And also the military itself um, might not have been quite so determined to carve out a Japanese empire of its own overseas if they thought they had more reliable allies floating around. So on the one hand, you could see a 1930s developing where a somewhat more moderate Japanese political field doesn't feel the need to go overseas quite as much. And bear in mind, the Western powers were prepared to allow a certain amount of Japanese overseas expansion um, but until they started to take issue with some of the uh, more nefarious and less pleasant aspects of their expansion to China. And as Italy and Germany rose in the 1930s, Perhaps Britain, when confronted by you know, some Japanese politicians going, well, we might want a bit more of a chunk of the Pacific, they might have been tempted to go, well, you know, we're not the world's biggest fan of the communists, and there's these fascists rising in Europe as well. And according to our predictions, there's probably going to be a war in the early 1940s. And well, if you look back at the 1910s, you did make out with a fair number of Japan's co of um, Germany's colonies when you joined the war on our side. Now, granted, Germany doesn't have that many overseas colonies left, but if you develop your fleet and build up your air force and you know keep them fresh, keep them trained, but don't waste them unnecessarily in China, well where we end up at war with Russia, or the Soviet Union, I guess, or Germany, or Italy, or some combination thereof, well, you'll be in a perfect position to uh, grab a chunk of their land. And in the aftermath of the war, we probably aren't going to raise too many objections to you keeping that. I mean, Italy has some rather nice colonies within, roughly speaking, your reach. And there's this whole big chunk of the Soviet Union on the Pacific coast, so, yeah, maybe just uh, you know, snip off a few bits of China here and there, just some limited stuff for your own security and let us share them. And you can have a bunch of other stuff when this next war breaks out. That might be one scenario. Another scenario, completely the opposite, might be the Japanese you know, still having the political developments that led to the way things went in the 1930s, still going after China and basically giving the British an ultimatum of either basically back us or shut up, which might lead to the dissolution of the Anglo-Japanese Treaty at that period. Or, who knows, Opium War with Mark III. You know, it, it's, a, it's a very open-ended scenario. 22NF2 asks, Setting the Mark XIV torpedo aside, what's the most horrific Darwin Award from the Pacific Theatre of World War II linked to the use of naval aviation? Conversely, what's the most terrific maritime Darwin Award in the Pacific Theatre that could have been averted with the use of naval aviation? Well, I think certainly one of the more horrific would be the slaughter of the Devastators at Midway. Now, that's not entirely because of the relative obsolescence of the Devastator itself, but more because they went in unescorted. Now, they had some escorts to start with, but unfortunately, for everyone involved, except perhaps some Japanese pilots who got easy kills, so a good chunk of the Devastators that did have escorts, at least when they left their carriers, managed to lose contact with those escorts on the way in. And as a result, when they showed up at the Japanese fleet, they were operating alone. And, well, generally unescorted torpedo bombers, when faced with fighter opposition, and heavy anti-aircraft fire don't tend to fare very well, so it's not necessarily the world's biggest surprise that the Devastators did fairly poorly. Um, but that did knock out not just, you know, basically the entire torpedo-carrying attack force of the US carrier fleet um, for a decent chunk of time until they could rebuild the squadrons and re-equip everybody with Avengers, but it also, you know, took out a lot of it fairly well-trained and experienced air crews, which 
you know doesn't help both the air crews themselves and more generally the operational efficiency of the torpedo strike squadrons and all of that would take a while to get back i mean even if you look as far forward in time as the guadalcanal campaign if you look at the balance of how many torpedo bombers were available at the Battle of Santa Cruz Island and the Battle of the Eastern Solomons relative to the number of Dauntlesses, and then you compare that to the torpedo bomber versus dive bomber availability at either Midway, generally for the US, or at, during the Guadalcanal campaign on the Japanese side, you can see the US is still struggling to a certain degree to bring its torpedo bomber formations back onto full strength. As far as what could have been averted with the use of naval aviation, well, Force Z is one that immediately comes to mind. Now, granted, you know, you're not going to get a full size fleet carrier to the area by December the 10th, but Hermes was already in the approximate operational area. Now, granted, she's not exactly the world's swiftest of carriers, and historically she was mostly carrying swordfish and so forth, but given that the Japanese bombers came in unescorted and attacked in sort of partial waves, then, you know, there's no zeros to worry about. If you'd taken Hermes and stuck, you know, even Buffaloes or Fulmars aboard, then given how many torpedoes repulsive aided, for example, despite having you know, most of the torpedoes available chucked at her, and given how lucky the hit to Prince of Wales was that crippled her, if Hermes had been around and had sent, you know, half a dozen to a dozen fighters into the sky, even if they didn't shoot much down, just the disruption effect on the Japanese bombers would have been huge. And the Japanese didn't have any other torpedo, long-range torpedo bombers, or indeed pretty much any reloads for the aerial torpedoes to hand so it's not like the bombers could have just gone home restocked and come back again by the time they'd managed to put together another full strike package it would have been too late force said would have gotten back to singapore for whatever good that would have done further on nathapon hongsheron asks dunkirk's 13 inch 50 caliber gun has an even faster muzzle velocity just than the latoria's 15 inch 50s how did the french make the barrel life 250 rounds well, there's a couple of factors to consider. Firstly, it, the fact that although the working pressure inside the chamber when the charge goes off is about the same for the Italian and the French guns, the Italian gun is obviously a 15-inch, so there's more internal volume, um, more surface area, but of course, thanks to the square cube law, that means that the proportion of volume to surface area is going to be greater. Uh, i.e. there's more volume um, also there's more propellant in the italian gun which means that although the working pressure per square inch is the same there's more square inches for that pressure to be exerted over in the italian gun so there's actually more energy in there w which is going to reduce the um, barrel life because obviously more energy slightly more scouring effect there's also the fact that the Italian shell obviously weighs more than the French shell, being a 15-inch shell, and therefore it's going to take slightly, just fractionally longer to get moving because there's slightly more inertia to overcome, which means that, you know, therefore there's going to be a slightly greater buildup of pressure as the behind the shell as it travels down the barrel, plus the Italian shell obviously by weighing more means it's going to exert more mechanical force on the rifling of the gun as it goes down there as the driving bands engage and there will be some slight differences in the metallurgy as well so all of which adds up to the fact that although the French gun does have as you mentioned a slightly higher muzzle velocity the total amount of energy imparted to the Italian 15 inch barrel is going to be greater both in terms of you know just sheer force of the expanding hot gases behind the shell and in terms of the mechanical stress put on the rifling by the rotating uh, shell and the driving band all of which adds up to more wear and tear even putting aside the fact the metallurgy of the two is going to be somewhat different because they're made by two separate manufacturers using two separate techniques and two separate formulations of steel Robert Sokal asks, 
What would you recommend to read about the reasons and the events of the British naval decline after the Second World War? Now, as you mentioned in the full question, this is a little bit outside the scope of the channel, so I'm not necessarily as au fait with the full range of books that might be available for th that era as I would be prior to 1950, but there are a few that I would point to. Um, there's this one, so you, many of you will be aware that I highly recommend the D.K. Brown's book series. So you've got Before the Ironclad, Warrior to Dreadnought, The Grand Fleet, and Nelson to Vanguard. There is actually another book to that series, which is this one you can see on screen at the moment, Rebuilding the Royal Navy, Warship Design Since 1945. So I don't have that one. Um, I probably should get myself a copy, but I don't have it purely because obviously it's the era that I don't really cover. Um, but I'd certainly, you know, based on the quality of all the others and the knowledge that D.K. Brown has, or, or had, and sadly he's no longer with us, but I would definitely re recommend that, especially since the book basically covers D.K. Brown's working career. So, you know, he was physically there in the Royal Navy Constructors' offices to see how it all uh, went down. Other books you could look at would be um, Norman Friedman has some. So uh, Norman Friedman has uh, British Carrier Aviation, which obviously carries on into like the Malta class and CVA-01, etc. Um, he also does British Destroyers, the Second World War and After, which will cover the development of, obviously, as it sounds, destroyers. And I think there's also more recently British Submarines of the Cold War. So although they'll be looking at the respective ship classes like with his british battleships and other books they'll be looking at the development you know uh the, de the environment surrounding their development as well which would probably be quite handy if anyone else has some recommendations um to explain the, the, how the royal navy progressed after the second world war through the cold war then feel free to enter them in the comments below as well greb asks when reading Kaiser's Cruises by Aidan Dodson and Dirk Nottleman, I was surprised by a picture on page 116 of SMS Lubeck in dry dock with two screws per shaft for a total of eight. Can you give me your opinion on this arrangement and possibly discuss the speed trials conducted in 1905 to 6 and whether this arrangement contributed to barely acceptable speeds or was it just the introduction of testing turbines? And lastly, do you know what the final configuration of screws was that Lubeck ended up with? So this is an artifact of early attempts at turbine propulsion because, you know, propeller efficiency gets better the larger the propeller and the slower the revolutions per minute, whereas turbine efficiency is higher at extremely high revolutions per minute. This is a little bit of a dichotomy and therefore a problem that you run into until the advent of geared turbines. And in the very early stages, especially for smaller ships with very fine stern profiles like destroyers or in this case a cruiser, you had a bit of a problem. Because if you ran with a single small propeller, or two, or in this case four, then... Once you started getting up to full speed rotations, you ended up with a massive, massive loss of efficiency because the propeller would be thrashing the water at extremely high speed and you get a lot of cavitation, loss of efficiency, and everything just went horribly wrong. And there were a couple of solutions to this. You could try and just put a slightly larger propeller on and the slightly larger propeller would obviously slow down the rotation slightly, but that would make your turbine less efficient and lead to more strain, but you'd get more of that energy into the water, but not a huge amount, so it wasn't an ideal solution. The other option, which is what you can see evidence of here, was to go with, well, actually, we'll just stick multiple pro propellers on the same shaft, and that way, in theory, even if one, any, even if all of them lose a degree of propulsive efficiency, by the fact there's so many of them we'll still get a decent amount of propulsion out of it as it goes. At least that was the idea. Um, as it turns out, as you mentioned in the speed trials, they tried a variety of configurations. Um, so ba the configuration you can see here, a configuration without the um, mid-shaft propellers, then a configuration that put those back on but put larger propellers at the very back of the shaft, and then a final configuration which was just the large propellers at the end of the shaft. 
but overall the speed differences weren't huge the speed you know you're talking about fractions of a knot across the entire board i think overall that was partly just because with the very very fine lines of the ship aft and how close together the shafts were you weren't going to get a large enough propeller to make a huge difference although it should be noted that the two tests that had the larger propeller um marginally larger propeller at the back did show a slight improvement in efficiency and speed now as a, this is basically in the many ways kind of an unsolvable problem until you get to geared turbines fully the only other way of dealing with it was to have high pressure and low pressure turbines or high pressure and low pressure systems um, depending on the layout of the ship where you would cruise on a pair of shafts using low pressure turbines which obviously would then theoretically hopefully rotate slower and then you open up the high speed and just if and run everything at once for top speed and just to accept the inefficiencies now this wasn't the most crazy configuration there were destroyers out there where that had three propellers per shaft but um you know teething troubles with turbines i think based on the fact that the last configuration was a four propeller configuration with the larger propellers at the end I would suspect, although I don't know for certain, that Lubeck ended up with that particular setup once she was in service. Um, that's also influenced by the fact that a variety of similar um, designs that were put in the water, not quite sister ships, but near enough, uh, that were put into the water thereafter also were four propeller designs, and they tended towards the larger scale of propeller, the bigger, the biggest ones they could fit on the shafts. And some of them even had different sized ones um, on the inner and outer shafts. So, as I say, although I don't know for certain without looking into it further, my suspicion is that Lubeck was probably left in her final configuration with just four slightly larger propellers. And that's what influenced the, the later on ships. And that brings us to the end of this week's video. Thank you very much for watching. Now, those of you who pay attention to the community post may have noticed I did a poll earlier this week where I asked basically, did people want to see sort of some of the very most common questions asked on the channel answered in a series of shorts um now whilst you know theoretically the poll shows a, a slightly higher proportion of people in favor there is a fairly large number of you who really don't like the shorts format and that's perfectly fair it's perfectly understandable i mean to be fair you know the channel is built on uh the five minute guides which are within youtube terms reasonably short videos but well you're listening to the dry dock this one's going for an hour 10 or so um and the wednesday videos are kind of between half an hour and an hour plus so it's understandable that a good chunk of the audience are here for the longer form videos so i think based on the feedback um I don't think I'll be moving forward with short format videos anytime soon, but I do like the suggestions that some people have come up with in the discussion for those uh, for that particular community post, which was maybe putting together a series of short FAQ style answers themed on certain subjects and then having those as kind of a beginner or newbie FAQ which can then be in its own playlist. So you could have kind of FAQs for the age of sale. The really common questions are there. FAQs for... No, World War One, World War Two, the infamous "What are those diagonal pipes on the outside of World War One battleships?" questions, that kind of stuff. Um, and then those videos will obviously then be in a slightly longer format. And if people want to look at them, then they can. And if they don't want to look at them, then they don't have to. But it's another thing that I can stick in the occasional Fun Friday because now we've got you know Fun Fridays will possibly cover the occasional FAQ video. They'll cover cover the introductions to series which seems to be working quite well looking through the library we'll do a few more of those and there's you know various other bits and that i've stuck into the fun fridays before as well so hopefully people will enjoy all of those so thank you very much for listening thank you very much for your input and feedback it is greatly appreciated and i hope to see you again in another video soon bye